All right, Psalm 38 is another one of those psalms where it's pretty singular in its focus of uh, topics that are kind of brought up. And um, an, this one is different than a lot of the other psalms that we've gone through. And I'm kind of excited. It's a really good subject that we get into. Let's just dig in uh, right away. You know, the, the first about 12 verses... I have here just all kind of grouped together. These all have to do with basically a believer who is, gets involved in sin and, and all of the things that go along with sinning as a believer. And, this, and it's kind of what this whole psalm is about and um, something that we really want to pay attention to and hopefully will help us to have the right mindset and to keep ourselves right and take heed to the warnings and the, and the events that are going on in here, the psalmist's life and, and, and what's going on. You know, even though these, you know, this is the word of God, which it is absolutely, you know, authored by the Holy Ghost, this still relates perfectly to the human instruments that were used to write, to pen down the word of God. So it's an amazing thing just if you stop and think about it for a while, how a man can be used in such a way that the writings that he's writing is not just, um, you know, it, it can still be the word of God and still 100% relevant and personal in that person's life, you know, with, with the things that are, that are going on. And yet, you know, it could still be in a sense coming from the heart, but, but still the word of God. Right, being moved by the Holy Spirit of God and saying things that both apply to the person as well as just are the Word of God. So um, let's let's look at this and and take it and and bring to remembrance, as you know, the title of this psalm is a psalm of David. It says to bring to remembrance. We need to bring this to our remembrance so we don't end up getting blinded by sin or thinking. Uh, you know, too haughty, haughtily of ourselves that we could never get into sin. You know, the Bible says, uh, let every man that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Right? That we, we need to, to take heed to ourselves and take heed where you're at spiritually, especially as you start to grow and you are making, getting victories over sin. You know, no matter how long it's been, no matter, you know, how good you're doing, don't let yourself get too full of yourself, of thinking that you're immune from sin and letting your guard down to sin and allowing yourselves to do things that maybe in the past you'd made these rules because you want to make sure that you don't get involved in certain sins. And then you just start thinking like, well, it's been a long time. I'm past that. And you start opening up, letting down your guard, changing the rules that you'd set up for yourself. And before you know it, people slip and fall and get involved in sin. And then you have to deal with the consequences of that sin. And we're going to read some of that here, starting in these first three verses. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Now, this verse has come up, this concept has come up in the past in the Psalms, but we want to make sure when, that, that we understand, yet, you know, the Lord loves all of his children and he chastens every son that he receives. So when, you, when you're born again, and we're going to get into this a little bit later, Actually, yeah, we're going to get into this a little bit later. When you're born again, you're not just, you know, it's, it's not like there's no more punishment for any sin ever because you're still going to be chastised and, and chastened. When you're born again, you become a child of God and God's going to deal with you as a father deals with his son. So when you go astray, when you do things that are bad, we do things that are wrong, then you got to face the discipline, the chastening of the Father. And this is a great way to start off this psalm as we get into this and we start seeing, you know, why he even brings us up is, hey, don't rebuke me in your wrath. Don't, when you're angry, you know, please, I know I need to rebuke, but don't rebuke me in your wrath and don't chasten me in thy hot displeasure when you're just super angry. Why? Because you're going to get it worse. Everybody knows. When the parents come across a child doing something, just, what are you doing? And, and their blood pressure goes up. And if you catch that child right away to give them that disciplining, it's going to be much worse than if some time has gone by and then they get to you. 
So we had a chance to cool down a little bit. And this is basically what David is saying to God, like, hey, don't rebuke me in your wrath, right? Like, I know I need to be corrected. Just show a little mercy here and, and not get uh, too upset with me and chasing me in thy hot displeasure. And then he continues on, though, because he says in verse 2, for thine arrows stick fast in me. Basically, I'm already receiving of it. You know, those arrows, they're already sticking in me fast. They're, they're sticking in me. And he says, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. So he's already getting it from God. He's already being chastened and punished from God. But then look at this. He says, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. And one of the things that you'll notice throughout this psalm is that there is no, um, you know, downplaying sin. There is no making excuse for his sin. It's completely accepting and saying, you know what? It's because of me. So he's saying, yeah, I'm getting it bad. Yeah, I'm getting chastised. Yeah, I'm getting pressed sore and the arrows are sticking in me. But why is that happening? It's because of my sin. It's because of my sin. And as much as we teach and preach the freeness of salvation and how great the gift is and how loving and merciful God is, and we go out on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, and go out and explain to people, you know, no matter what you've done, God can forgive you of your sins, that that gift is available, and you don't have to die and go to hell, and that you could go to heaven, and all of your sins could be wiped out and forgiven, and you're washed in the blood of Christ, and you're sealed, and you're sanctified. What great news that is, but don't let that deceive you into thinking that you won't be chastised and punished in this life after you're born again when you go off and sin. Because you will. And I'm going to stress this because I do believe it's important to bring this up even when you're out soul winning so people can fully understand the concept. Because we get, you know, it, too many times people will falsely accuse us just as the Bible says, you know, let us do, do evil as that good may come. Right? And they were saying, you know, that they were being falsely accused of having this attitude of, well, I mean, let's just let grace abound, right? Because where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. And that's a truth and that's a fact. And some people that believe in, that are trusting in themselves and how good they are don't like to hear that, that yes, it is true. Yes, it's true that no matter how much you sin, if you have Christ as your Savior, you are forgiven of all those sins. And you will not spend one day in hell. And even if you continue to sin after that, you will not ever go to hell because God has given you a free gift of eternal life. And it's not based on how good you live. And that's a fact. But we also, it's important to, to get the, the full understanding just in general of what the gospel is and what it isn't. Because people accuse you of saying, oh, so you're just giving people a license to sin. You, so you think you just have a license to sin now because, because you're saved? Is that what it is? No. A license means you have permission to sin. And you know what? God's not giving you permission to sin at all. What, sh shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! That's what the Bible says. So no, we don't teach people or show people that you have a license to sin. Absolutely not. And there are, there are repercussions for your actions. And you are going to reap what you sow if you continue to sin. But I'll tell you what, that doesn't change. That still doesn't change the fact of eternal life being a free gift. And once you receive that, you're saved forever. Okay, they're two different things. Receiving eternal life and being chastised and chastened in this lifetime because as a child of God, you've gotten into sin. And we need to be aware of both because both are true. You can't just sin and get away with it. And that's what, other, that's what people like, you know, one of the reasons they don't like hearing the doctrine of once saved, always saved, which is the gospel, which is eternal life. And people will shy away from that because they think, oh, so you, could, so you think you could just sin and it's okay. And it's just fine. No, it's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's just fine. And that's, that's how people relate this stuff. And we need to make sure we're doing a good job of expressing that. And if you hear people you know, bring up that, that argument against you, squash it. Say, no, that's not what I believe. 
Make sure you, you're clear and say, I'm not saying it's okay. I'm not saying it's just fine. I am saying that Christ paid for every single sin before I was ever born. I am saying that that payment applies to the sins that I've committed in the past as well as the sins I'm going to commit in the future. But I'm not saying it's okay to sin because it's not okay to sin because it's still a transgression. You're still breaking God's law and it's still going to make God angry. But I am saying that Jesus' blood is the only way to get to heaven and it has nothing to do with how well I obey the commandments. But let's continue on here. He says, it's because of my sin. Verse number four, for mine iniquities are gone over mine head. As in heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. So he's talking about now the weight that bears down on him because of his iniquity. He said, my iniquity is just too much basically to bear. And you need to remember this. When you, when you get into sin, it's going to end up being a weight on your shoulders. It's going to bring you into bondage. It's going to cause you then ultimately to be in a state or condition where you know, it, it's not as fun as you, as you thought it was going to be when you started getting into the sin. And it's going to make things in your life a lot more difficult and a lot harder for a variety of reasons and a variety of ways, especially depending on what sins you're getting into. Right? Whatever it is, it's going to add a weight to your shoulders. It's going to add some level of bondage, some level of, of making it harder now to get out than you ever thought it was going to be. You think, oh, I'm just going to do this real quick and I won't do it again. And it's just, I just want to, I just want to have this little bit of fun or whatever it is. And before you know it, you realize you didn't do what you thought you were going to do. You ended up going a little bit farther than you thought you planned on. And then, you know, you stayed a lot longer than you were planning on staying. And that's what sin does. It's going to keep you there. It's going it's, it, it's to bring you in a bondage. It's going to cause a weight to come down. And, and uh, let's keep reading here. He says, And every burden there, too heavy for me. Verse number five, My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. Now, I don't think he's necessarily uh, talking about physical wounds. He may be. And, and this may be something that happens from, from a, a fornication or adultery type of a, of a sin where you can get a disease that leaves you with sores and leaves you, your body in a condition that is going to end up stinking because of the disease itself. That may very well be the case. But even just applied spiritually, you know, spiritually you stink when you get into sin. Spiritually, you're just going to be like, man, there's, where, where have you been hanging out? What crowd have you been running with? Where have you been? You've been, you've been hanging out in the gutter. And you know, when you hang out in the gutter, you start to stink. That's why when you walk into the cesspools that are called bars, they stink. They stink something nasty. You've never walked into a bar that smelled good. You walk in and be like, oh, wow, this smells nice in here. Why? Because the, the booze itself is rotten. That's right. yeah. the, the fermentation and everything that's, that's in the booze itself, it's just rotten poison that gets spilled all over the place because people act stupid when they get drunk and they lose their motor skills and you spill things all over the place. People vomit. And you know what? You can only clean so well and so much. And that stuff just gets in there. And let's face it, you know, and then it's and on top of it, then when these things happen, it's dark. So the cleanup job isn't going to be that great. I mean, the whole thing just stinks. And just as the, you know, pick the sin, right? That's an easy one to, to see the stink. But... Whatever the sin is, it's going to come along with its own level of stink and its own bondage and its own oppression on you. Even if you can't see it going into it, know that it will happen. And it does happen. Verse number six, I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. See, when people get into sin, they think they're going to be happy. They think they're going to be, oh man, we're going to have fun. That's not really what happens though. Maybe, maybe for a moment, there's some joy and stupidity and foolishness and, and this, this vain entertainment or joy that you get. But I'll tell you this much. The longer and the farther removed you get from things, 
and the more holy and righteous you can start to live, the less of even that vain enjoyment you're ever going to receive from sin. The more knowledge you have, the, the, the closer you're able to get to, to walking a righteous, godly life, the more that, that sin is going to bother you and you won't get any satisfaction or any gratification even to the flesh of getting involved in the sin because it's, it, you're just automatically going to be like, hopefully, right? I mean, and definitely the longer you go doing right, when you start getting involved, it's just going to be like, this isn't even, like I thought I was going to enjoy this, but it's not even enjoyable at all. I mean, I couldn't imagine if, if, if I wanted to go out because one of my sins of the past was like drinking, right? And getting drunk. I'd be, th I'd be petrified the whole time. If I just decided to go out, you're like, man, I'm just going to go have a beer. Like, it would be the least enjoyable thing that I could think of doing. It's like, man, this just isn't, like, I wouldn't even want to risk it. Right? And you know, that's good to have that feeling because you know what that is? That's a proper fear of the Lord. And when you have that level of fear of the Lord, it's going to keep you straight on a lot of things. Just like kids ought to have that proper fear of their parents. They're like, you know what? I'm not even going to do that. I mean, it, everybody's going to end up doing some things that are not right. Okay, but we need to be the kids where it's like, okay, they did that, but it, you know, it's not that bad. The kids ought to be petrified into getting, but like, Man, I'm never going to do that. I don't know what my parents would do if they caught me doing that. And it's the same attitude with God because here's the thing. You know, you may think you could get away with stuff with your parents. You can't get away with anything from God. Right. <laughs> he sees everything. I mean, there's no way. You know, I teach my children that I can hear everything <laughs> and see what they do, you know, but they're going to realize that there may, there may be some times where I can't. But don't test it. <laughs> but God sees everything. And God knows everything. And you know what? You've got to be more concerned with the punishment that God's going to bring on you anyways. And, um, you know, he's, he's going to make sure that, you know, because God loves you. And think about this. God loves you even more. God loves my children even more than I do. It's a fact. I love my kids. But he loves them even more. And, you know... The kids, you think you get a harsh punishment from dad because I love you. Well, think about having a harsh punishment from God. He loves you even more, right? So it's not, it's not going to be as satisfying and gratifying as you think. Just like David saying here, I go mourning all the day long. Verse number seven, for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease and there is no soundness in my flesh. And here we see, I, I do think that this is referring to, a, I mean, a real disease. He's, he's got a disease. He's got a, a troublesome, a disease that he hates, a disease that's just, man, not worth it at all based on the sin that he's done. Like, you, you, you commit a sin one time and you could have a, a lifetime of disease. Not worth it. Not worth it at all. Ever. He says, there's no soundness in my flesh. Boy, how, what, what, something not to take for granted, just being in good health and not having disease. That's right. Verse 8, I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Notice the things that he's, he's talking about here, being mourning, disquietness of heart. That's not having peace. That's not having joy. That's not having all of the things that everybody really wants to have. Let's face it. I, I don't know anyone who doesn't want to have those things, which are all the fruit of the Spirit. The gentleness, goodness, faith, right? Peace, joy, all these things that, that man, I would love to have these things in my life. And people go after the fake substitute of joy when they get involved in sin. And what does it bring you? It doesn't bring you joy. It brings you mourning. You don't end up having peace, right? People want to run away from their problems and do drugs and drink and everything else. You don't get peace from that. You know what it's going to do? It's going to make you even more depressed. It's going to make you more sad. It's going to, it's going to make your problems even worse than if you just turn to the Lord with your problems instead of turning to the bottle or turning into sin, turning to, you know, the strange woman, turning to whatever.
There's no peace here in what he's saying. I've roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Verse number nine, Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it, is also, it also is gone from me. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and my kinsmen stand afar off. So he's saying, my pe people don't even want to get close to me anymore. My friends, my family, you know, they're, they're keeping their distance. And then it says in verse 12, not only that, not only are the people who are close to him now not wanting to get close to him, which that's where you turn to for your comfort and edification. You don't get that anymore. He says, they also that seek after my life, his enemies, lay snares for me. And they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. Wow, who'd have thought? All of these things are happening. Why? Because of my sin is what it says in verse number three. Turn if you would to Romans chapter seven. The foolishness of the person who thinks, oh, once saved, always saved, so you think you just have a license to sin. Oh, you can just get away with it. Yeah, I don't call this getting away with it at all. Having mourning, disquietness, no soundness in the flesh. You know, your enemies are, are setting traps for you now. Your friends don't have anything to do with you. Sorry, this is, not all, this is not what it's all cracked up to be. And this is not, oh, you're just getting away with your sin at all. That's why one of the best ways I like to explain this to people is bringing up the concept of being a child, being born again, because it's like saying, oh man, if I don't put my kids in my oven and turn it on broil and lock them in there, then they're just getting away with all the things that they do when they break the rules. No, not at all. <laughs> they get disciplined. They get spanked. They get punished. They have that chastisement. It's not that they're not getting punishment if I don't just burn them and torture them. But I'm never going to do that because I love them because they're my kids. And see, God's never going to do that with his children either. Even when they screw up, he's going to discipline them. He's going to chastise them. For sure. Undoubtedly. But he's never going to cast them into hell where the people who were never born again go. The people who are never part of his family go. The people who aren't receiving the chastisement of the Lord. Because they're bastards, not sons. Those are the wicked that seemingly get away with everything in this world. They're not getting the same punishment. They actually can enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now again, sin in itself inherently is going to bring the, the misery and stuff, but it's not the, on the same level. It's not the, the same type of punishment that you get as a child of God versus an unbeliever. God's going to come down hard on you as a child of God for acting like the heathen acts. Romans 7 does a great job also of helping to explain the dichotomy that we have as believers. When we sin, that we still have that new man. We're still born again in the spirit. And that new birth, it's not the flesh, it's the spirit. Verse number 14 in Romans 7, the Bible reads, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And I'm going to pause here just for a minute because this is, again, the Apostle Paul who's writing this. Yes, it's the Word of God, but this is still the Apostle Paul, the one saying, I am carnal, sold under sin. The... the the fake Christianity out there, the holiness people that think that you could live, live sinlessly perfect and stuff, you know, they'll say, well, I'm not carnal. Oh, you know, I haven't sinned in weeks or months or years or whatever. <laughs> oh, really? Because you're so much more holy than the Apostle Paul was, right? And if the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm carnal, sold under sin, then guess what? You probably are too. Right. You definitely are. Okay, we have a carnal body. That's what carnal means, is your flesh. And flesh is not regenerate yet. It's unregenerate. And the flesh was called, you see that, well, well, I'll keep reading here. We'll see that as we get into Romans 7. Verse number 15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would or what I want, that do I not. 
but what I hate, that do I. Again, the Apostle Paul saying, I'm doing the things I don't want to do, and I'm not doing the things I want to do. Why? Because he's carnal. Now, was the Apostle Paul the worst Christian in the world? No, of course not. But this shows you that even the best Christian has these things happening to him where he's thinking like, man, I just, you know, I want to do all this good. And did the Apostle Paul do a lot of good? Yes, he did. But he do, was he perfect? Of course. Of course not. He knew he wasn't perfect. He knew. He's like, man, there's things I want to do I'm not doing. And then there's some things I don't want to do and I end up doing those things. Verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I can send under the law. law is, hey, law's still the law. Law's still good. If I do something wrong, if I break the law and I'm a sinner, that's on me. It's not the law's fault. Verse 17, now there's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. And just this concept, he says, sin dwells in me. So for people just to say like, oh, well, I'm without sin. Really? You're still in that flesh. I think the sin's dwelling with you. And he's explaining, yeah, I still have a free will. To will is present with me. But how just to do and make sure that my will will <laughs> allow me to do everything that's right is that I'm having a hard time doing that. Yes, I have a free will. Yes, to will is present with me. And yes, I have sin dwelling in me. So trying to find the way of, of doing what's right all the time, I'm having a hard time doing it. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. So even when he wants to do good, he's saying, I still have this evil with me because he's still in the flesh. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. He's saying, I still love the law of God. I do. The inward man loves the law of God. That new spirit, that regenerate spirit that you got when you were born again, that came alive. That loves all the things of God. And that's going to help drive you and walk in the Spirit and help you to do what's right and to avoid the sins of the flesh. But you know what? If it was all alone without the flesh, then you would be able to just walk in the Spirit all the time. But the problem is you still have the flesh. That is the problem. And when you walk in the flesh, then you need to be prepared for the chastisement and the punishment that goes along with that as a born-again believer. Verse 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity. Remember that bondage I was talking about with sin? The, the flesh bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And, you know, hopefully this is the way that you feel too. Because you want to do what's right. You've got that new man. And any time the flesh tries to take over, you know, it's discouraging. And you go, man, I just want to be rid of the stinking body that's causing me to do bad things. I just want to do what's right. And I want to do it right all the time. Because that's what I want. And I'm having a hard time finding a way to do right all the time. Because it's what I want to do. But his body is just holding me back and making me do these things. And I don't want to do them. And so he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but the flesh, the law of sin. And what we need to do, hey, we have a will. We do have a will. So there's no excuse. And he's not giving an excuse. He's just explaining reality. He's not excusing any sin that he does. Just as David doesn't excuse the sin that he did. But the reality is we still have the sinful flesh that's going to tempt us and lure us into making bad choices. And because of that, sometimes we lose out to the flesh. Now, we still deserve to be punished for that. And we're going to reap what we sow. But we have to understand the nature. And even understanding that nature is important too, which goes along with salvation. Because I don't want people doubt, oh man, I don't know if I'm really saved because, you know, I'm... I'd really like to have a drink right now, or I'd really like to do this, or I'd really like to do that sin. You know, and these people that teach you got to repent of all of your sins and be saved are the ones who are causing the confusion 
Because now you got people who are honest with themselves and they're not just trying to put on a front in a show and, oh, I'm so holy and I've never wanted to do anything bad after I got saved and I never cussed again and I never drank again and I never smoked again and I never did this again and I never did that again and I just lived perfect ever since I got saved because I repented all my sins and I'm truly saved. And these people like to showboat and they're dishonest with themselves and they're dishonest with everyone else. They're probably not dishonest with themselves. They, just, they know they're lying. All those phonies know that they've sinned and they want to sin, you know, at some level, right? I'm not saying they're all just unsaved necessarily, but, you know, when you start, the harder you get on that doctrine, the more likely it is that you're not saved. Because people telling you, you got you to gotta get rid of all that sin to be saved or whatever, and you're never going to want to do any of that stuff again. It's just simply not true. So if that were the case, then you could question the Apostle Paul's salvation. Because he's the one saying, hey, I, I'm a wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The body's causing me to do all these things I don't want to do. Oh, but you're perfect, right? And you don't do those things anymore. Because you've been saved and I repented all my sins. Nonsense. Garbage. And you know what? That type of teaching, it spreads beyond just within churches. Other people hear this stuff. And now we got to deal with that when we go out and preach the gospel and make sure that the people who are unsaved out there can understand that it's not, that's not how you get saved. I mean, how many people, and you don't have to show you raise your hands or anything, because I know everybody's experiences has gone soul winning for any length of time. You run into people, oh yeah, I'm not quite ready to get saved yet. Why? Because they're thinking, well, I need to stop drinking. I need to stop smoking. I need to get my life in order. You know, like, man, I, I want to. I've got kids now and, and I want to do this. I just, it's just, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm quite ready yet to get saved. I, there's still some things that I'm dealing with. That's not salvation. You've been taught that way by some liars. These holier than nows that want to puff themselves up and think that they're so spiritual and righteous and you're so wicked and bad and you need to clean up your life before you get saved, that's not the way it is. Jesus Christ will save you today. Now is the day of salvation. Amen. Receive the free gift as everyone who's ever been saved had to do. Humble yourself. Receive the gift and be saved of all your sins. And that new man, that new creature will desire to do what's right. It will. But that flesh that hasn't changed is still going to want you and try to lead you to do all manner of sin. Yeah. And the ones that are going to be the easiest to do are the ones that you already had a problem with up to that point. Those will be the easiest ones to get back into. And that's a fact. And these people that want to claim that someone who was a drunk and then got saved and oh well they're back into drinking again well then they must not be saved phony liar bunch of garbage teaching we have a flesh Romans 7 I mean so many places in the Bible prove this so many places do I like pointing to Romans 7 just because you got the Apostle Paul saying hey look I'm carnal and I'm not doing all the things that I want to do and he's done all kinds of great things so if he's having a problem trying to get his flesh under control, everyone has a problem getting their flesh under control. It's a war. That's why I said, you know, in, in another, another place, I die daily. Daily. I mean, this is a daily battle of spirit versus flesh. We have the will. We have a will. We can decide. We can choose what we're going to do. But we need to battle every day against that flesh and battle to do what's right. And understand, and one of the things that might help you to make the right choice, to will and, and choose the right way, is understanding that if I choose the wrong way, if I do what's bad, if I do what's wrong, there's a punishment that's going to be coming. And it's not going to be pleasant and it's not going to be good. So let's avoid that and choose right. And look at what David wrote in Psalm 38 for those first 12 verses of all the problems that he's having in his life because of his own sin. That if he didn't get involved in his sin, he wouldn't have those things. And guess what? David was saved. 
and all of his sins were forgiven eternally. He never had to worry about going to hell. But as a believer, you still have to worry about being punished by God right here, as long as you're alive on this earth. You know what David never has to worry about now? He never has to worry about getting punished by God anymore. The flesh is gone. It's in the ground. It's, it's, it's part, of, part of the dust. But while he was on this earth, you better believe he received for his sins. But he's never going to have to face hell. And that's the same for every believer. It's good news. Go back to Psalm 38. Verse number 13, But I as a deaf man heard not, and I was as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. And this was, just going back to the context, verse 12 was, They also that seek after my life lay snares for me. So, the, so his enemies basically are, are saying you know, mischievous things, and they're, and they're trying to plot and plan against him. And he's saying, while these things are going on, you know, he's in sin, and he's in darkness. So, I'm like a deaf man. I didn't hear. I'm like a dumb man. I, you know, I, this stuff's going on around me, and you're not going to be able to, to even know what's going on. I'm not saying you always will be able to, but you know what? If you're, if you're a child of light and you're walking in the light, it's a lot easier to see the snares and the traps that are laid out for you than when you, you give up your guard and you start walking in darkness. And then you're gonna, Then you'll fall into those traps. Verse number 14, Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. He's not correcting the wicked anymore. And that's also another thing that happens when you start getting sin and get involved in sin yourself. It becomes a, a lot harder to, to, to be able to judge and, and give reproofs when it's needed because now it's like, well, who am I? Look what I'm doing, right? Now, if you could live that example and, and be walking in the Spirit, then... Great. You can, you can help people through reproofs because that's the point of a reproof, by the way, too, is to help them. Not to make yourself feel good about yourself because they're doing something bad. It's to help them. Have charity. Do it for the right reason. Verse 15, For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord my God. For I said, hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. In verse 18, this is the solution. This is the answer to the sin problem. For I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. The contrition, the sorrow, and the repentance that comes from your sin is when you're going to start being able to heal and recover from your sin and get out of the situation where everything is going wrong and you're being chastised and punished. And God will then start to show mercy and be there for you. But you have to have that attitude. Don't let the chastisement of the Lord and the bad things that happen drive you away from God. Let them drive you to Him. Amen. And turn to Him and... Declare your iniquity. Just admit that you've done wrong. And, and there are so many people that this is a number one problem for them is being able to ever admit that they've done wrong. And, you know, unfortunately, if you didn't learn that as a kid, it's just going to be even harder when you're an adult. The kids need to learn to just accept, hey, I've done wrong. And you know what? If you can do, kids, th this is going to go a long way for you. If you could admit to your parents honestly, not deceitfully, honestly own your mistakes. I've done wrong. I am sorry. Your life will be a lot better at home. Your punishments will be diminished. The mercy will be increased when you can admit and apologize and say, I'm sorry for what I did. And you know what? If you can have an attitude like that, that's humble, that's not going to be stiff-necked, you're not going to be rebellious, that will help you as you grow into adulthood and maintain a humble attitude. So that way, you know, maybe you get on job or anywhere else in life, 
to be able to just still admit that you've done wrong. It's going to help you. Because when you can't do that, it kind of makes people angry. The same way it makes a father angry when the child is not willing to admit, like, look, I caught you. This is what you did. You know it's not right and it's wrong. And they still just don't want to accept that, oh, there's always an excuse, right? No one wants to hear that. No one wants to hear that from their kids. And no one wants to hear that from anyone else when they've done wrong. Just own it. Don't lie. Don't backpedal. Don't give me all the excuses. Apostle Paul wasn't giving excuses for his sin. David's not giving excuses for his sin. He's saying, you know what? I'm going to declare mine iniquity. There it is, God. I'm, I did it. I'm guilty. And I'm going to be sorry for my sin. The Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Don't try to cover up what you've done wrong. Just confess it to God. And say, God, I did this. I can't hide it. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it again. Forsake it. You say, well, Pastor Burzins, I thought you just said you didn't have to do, you know, look. For your eternal salvation, there's a level of, you do have to recognize that there's a punishment for your sin. What I preach against is the people that just overemphasize emotion and feelings, just all these things. Oh, man, you got to be real sorry and, and, and never want to do it again. That is not what's necessary for your eternal soul to be saved. You have to understand the penalty for your sin. You absolutely do. You can't just think that you don't deserve hell. If you think you don't deserve a punishment because you're so good, then you can't be saved. You, that is part of understanding, you know, receiving a Savior is what are you being saved from? You have to have that level. So wh whether that means it makes you cry, whether that means you feel horrible about yourself or not, or you could just admit it and say, yep, I did it. No matter what your personal reaction is, what's required is just recognizing that and accepting that. And then accepting Jesus Christ as the payment for your sin and trusting in him to save you. What he did. That's what's required. This isn't talking about your soul being saved. This is talking about a chastisement from the Lord that you want to receive mercy from. Because as a child, you just, that's not even an option. It's not on the table of going to hell. And this is how you receive mercy. Confessing, forsaking, declaring your iniquity, being sorry for your sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, again, a, a, a verse that oftentimes is taken out of context and applied towards um, you know, the salvation of your soul, talks about godly repentance. And I'll read it for you. Verse number 8, the Bible reads, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. And he's bringing up the fact that he wrote that first epistle to Corinth, Right? This is 2 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians. He laid into them. They're guilty of doing things wrong. And he rebuked them and laid into them. And they felt bad about it. And you know what? That's how they ought to feel. And that's how you ought to feel when your sin is pointed out. When you come into church and you hear the Bible preached. And you hear your sin being preached on. And you start to feel bad. You know what? That's a good sign. Receiving that level of, of punishment or chastisement. Embrace that. And use that to help you do what's right. Just like he says here in verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. See, the point isn't just to make you feel bad. And I preach the way I preach, and I preach on the things I preach on. It's not just to make, it's not like, ha, 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 I, I can't wait to make everybody feel bad. That's not the point. That's not the goal, right? He says, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorrow, sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us and nothing. So you know what I'd like to see if you're involved in sin? I'd like to preach as hard as I can about it so that you feel sorry, but not just because I want you to feel bad, because I want you to sorrow to repentance. To say, man, 
this is really bad. I need to change this and I need to get right with God. So that you have that action of going, I'm going to stop that. That's the goal. That's the point. That's why the Apostle Paul was, was coming down hard on the church at Corinth. That's why he, he wrote the way that he did. And look at what happened. He says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, again, I've brought this up in the past. Salvation can mean many things. It can it apply to the salvation of your soul, your saving of your soul. Yes, it can. But it can also apply to the saving of your flesh. It can also apply to the saving of many things, your marriage, your, you know, there's lots of things to be saved from. G uh, uh, David, we see in the Psalms, oftentimes is praying to God for deliverance and salvation from his enemies. It's all based on context. So you can't, ju just because you see the word doesn't automatically assume that it has to do with your soul. It may judge it by the context. Verse number 11, for behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sword. And this is what happened when you, got, when you sorrow after a godly sword. When you're sorry for your sins, when, you, when you've heard it, you understand? He says, what carefulness it wrought in you. Now, they're being more careful in what they're doing. That's a good thing, right? They're not being haphazard and careless and just, well, whatever. No, they're actually caring about the word of God. They're using carefulness. He says, yea, what clearing of yourselves, getting right. Hey, I did this wrong. Now I'm going to clear that. I'm going to get right. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Fear of God. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. Saying, man, now you're on fire because you've gone the exact other direction and now you're fired up. You're zealous and you're ready to do what's right. That's what he wanted to do. And he's saying, I, I, I almost felt bad that I wrote it. But then I saw, hey, it worked. Great. That was the goal. And now look at how fired up you are. Amen. In all things, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Good. Amen. You got right with God. And it was all from their godly sorrow that worked the repentance to them to get right with God. This is why we preach hard. This is why I love hard preaching. This is why I even, one of the reasons why I wanted to be a pastor is to pre, and to preach hard is to help people get to the point of godly sorrow that works to repentance because your life will be better the more sins you can turn from and get out of your life the better off you're going to be the more blessed you have you'll be the more peace you'll have the more joy you'll have everything back to psalm 38 verse number 19 Bible reads, but mine enemies are lively and they are strong and they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries because I follow the thing that good is. And we've gone over this concept, you know, a bunch of times before, but there are people out there that's just going to do, they're going to render evil for good. So when you do good, they're actually they're going to do bad because you're doing good. And that's why he says here, he says, they're my adversaries because I follow the thing that's good, that good is. So you're doing what's good. You're doing what's right by, by obeying the Bible and, and following the word of God. And there are people out there that hate that and they will do you, do you wrong because of that. Because you're a Christian, because you're trying to live a separated life, because you're trying to do what's right, they're going to do bad to you. And for what, I don't know what all the reasons are, but it's just because they hate God. Or they hate the Bible and they just can't stand to see someone else. And you know what? Sometimes it's because people are convicted of their own sins by how you live and they just want to try to bring you down a notch. And if they can't cause you to sin, they'll just try to bring you down anyways. Just because they don't like their own sins being exposed. Lots of people are like that. Just can't stand to see it, so they're just going to do whatever they can to see you suffer. Try to make themselves feel better because they're selfish people. Verse 21, forsake me not, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So again, the right answer is turning to the Lord. David was involved in sin. David was involved in some bad sins. We read about them. We know about some of them. Really bad sins. But you know what he ended up doing? Turning to God. Did he suffer as a result of his sins? You better believe he did. We see that. But he still turned to God even with his suffering 
and still turn to God to defend him. And you know what? God did. He did defend him. And he did show mercy. Because the Bible's true. <laughs> the word of God is true. And, and think about this. We've read a lot about all the bad things that'll happen when you get involved in sin, especially as a believer, right? And, and all the bad things that'll, that'll be happening to you. But don't lose sight of this either, that your enemies, as you living as a Christian and trying to do what's right, your enemies are just waiting for you to screw up. They're ready to pounce on an opportunity for you to get caught doing something bad, for you to do something wicked, for you to just get busted doing something wrong, getting into sin. Beware of letting yourself get caught up in sin because after God's done chastening you, the enemy can be relentless. God's going to show mercy. The enemy doesn't. The, the, the reprobate, the Bible says they're unmerciful. They're implacable. That means they can't be satisfied. It's never enough. That's why you see the alphabet animals going after people and they, nothing is ever good enough for them. I mean, if someone comes out and then they, they say just one thing that's offensive and they go on the attack and then they're back, oh, no, I'm sorry. They don't stop there. They just keep going because they want to destroy and they stop at nothing less. Whereas the Lord, when you do wrong and you apologize to God, you say, God, I'm sorry. God shows mercy. But remember that when you decide to get into sin, because even though you may be done facing what God has for you, the enemy is still going to be coming after you and trying to, to, to beat you down even harder. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Jeremiah 20.10 this is, this is the attitude of the wicked people had towards Jeremiah. And I'm going to close on this. Jeremiah 20.10 says, For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side. Report, say they, and we will report it. All my familiars watched for my halting, saying, Peradventure he will be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. That's the attitude that the wicked people have on the righteous person. They're just waiting and this is in, in, in the context he's saying, you know what? I'm preaching the, the truth. I'm preaching what God, and no one wants to hear it. So I just wasn't going to say anything anymore. But the fire was in him, and he could not hold in. But then, and then it goes on to say this, you know, I heard the defaming of many. You know, people are just talking bad about him. They're talking smack about him. There's fear on every side. And they're saying, yeah, just say something. Report. We're going we're gonna to be on you. Like white on rice. We're going to be on you, you know, ready. Whatever you're saying, we're going to be on it. All my familiars watch for my halting. Peradventure, he'll be enticed and we shall prevail against him. People will be watching for you to slip up, to screw up, to get involved in some sin because you know what? They're going to tear you down. Watch out for that. Many reasons to think about. Hopefully, you know, I know the way sin works. Sin, sinful activities, the flesh is going to try to make you not remember things like this. It's going to try to minimize it. Oh, you could get away with it. Oh, it's not really that bad. Oh, it's no big deal. Oh, come on. Oh, look at all these other people are doing it. Oh, you know, don't deceive yourselves by that. It's a foolish way of thinking. Because the Bible warns us on reality and what's really going to happen. And like I said, the more involved you get and the more you do for the Lord and the more you kind of get your life cleaned up, the worse it's going to be on all fronts. The more, I mean, as a pastor, as other people get, you know, the eyes get more and more on you waiting for you to stumble and fall. And you know what? Also, the punishments could be that much worse too from God because unto whom much is given of the same shall much be required. A lot required. And you have a lot of knowledge. It's a lot required of you too. Don't blow it. Right? And when you do find yourself in sin, don't turn from the Lord because the Lord is merciful. And you know what? Even from those enemies, I was saying they can be merc you know, merciless and relentless and implacable, God can still deliver you from them too. So it's not that there's no hope. It's just be aware of 
of all of the consequences that could happen as a result of your sin. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, help us to be good children. Help us to, to walk in the Spirit and to mortify the deeds of our flesh, dear Lord. Uh, we love you. We want to do what's right. God, I can't wait for the day that, uh, that Jesus Christ comes back and, and our bodies are changed. Hopefully, we'll, we'll be alive here to see it in the flesh. Uh, if not, uh, Lord, I'm still looking forward to the day when we receive that new body and that we will be in that, uh, that glorified state with you. Uh, we love you. And we thank you so much for, for saving us and giving the free gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.